Well, this is a fallacy that the books will tell you that uh, you can't, you can, and people know that phrase, oh, you can't be made to do something against your will. Actually, you can. Um, I'm not even going to describe an, an, an analogy of that, but who's to say, how does that person, know, they pick up a bomb, how do they know whether it's a real bomb or a fake bomb? They don't know. So you could with the power of suggestion, trick somebody into doing something bad. Look, you're, you're working with people, so people have an innate, they're in a mode of wanting to survive. And people generally, if they're told to do something that's, that they know is bad, I'll put it that way, if they're told to do something that they know is against their morals, they won't do it, that's right. So. Even if you have a person up on stage with stage hypnosis and you tell them to strip, they know there's an audience there. They won't strip completely. They'll strip down quite a bit, but they won't totally strip. Unless that person is already a stripper or has done it at parties and has no inhibitions. You know? yeah. So there's, their moral instinct takes over. It's not hypnosis. Although there are some sorts, some types, there's many types of meditation, thousands of different meditations, different types of meditation, and some meditation is a variant on hypnosis. The two sound like they're the same. Um, actually, the true, or the true focus of the mind, which you would call meditation, is not hypnosis. It's not a, it's not a um, practice of hypnosis. There is such a thing as let's say, perfect concentration on the perfect point, which is kind of what meditation is supposed to be about. Perfect concentration on the perfect point. But 99% of people who do meditation do not have that. They have no idea what perfect concentration on the perfect point is. They're just practicing something that somebody told them or they read it in a book or heard it on a CD or something. And you could say also that 99% of people, when they do some sort of meditation, whatever they're doing, is probably a form of hypnosis. Okay? But then when you get to perfect concentration or a perfect point, that is not hypnosis. It's not even using the mind. I've worked for Dr. Maxwell, Maxwell Maltz in the Bahamas, his company, and uh, my friend who got me over there was his partner at that time in the early 70s. <clears throat> and Dr. Maxwell Maltz wrote Psycho-Cybernetics. When that came out, it sold 13 million copies the first year. I think it was the first book ever on self-image psychology. And uh, he was a plastic surgeon and he worked with people you know, who were disfigured and so on. He discovered this thing about the self-image. So that's a great book to read, Psycho-Cybernetics. Uh, but you can't go past thinking very rich. You can't go past that. Napoleon Hill knew what he was doing when he wrote that book. And that's a classic too. I like to go back to the classics. Not all the books that came after that that, that are regurgitated. And there are some great motivational speakers these days, but they've all gone back to their, if they go back to their roots, Think and Grow Rich was the classic, and Psycho-Cybernetics. But also um, Dr. Ainsley Mears wrote a lot of books about uh, curing cancer and all sorts of things using what he described as meditation. And he may have even, I'm not sure, he may have even called it hypnosis. But it's a way of, you know, visualising the, the good guys and the bad guys in your blood. And the bad guys killing off the good guys. Uh, the good guys killing off the bad guys, rather. So curing people themselves, curing themselves of cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's a, their famous book, Dr. Angley Mears. Uh, another good book that has nothing to do with hypnosis, which I recommend to people, is How to Win Friends and Influence People by uh, Al Carnegie. So I like to go back to the classics, the original texts, you know, as much as possible. Now, there may have been books before that, but I haven't found any. Because I incorporate <coughs> my hunches, my intuition, my psychic flow when I'm doing, uh, when I'm working with patients and clients, mm -hmm. and because I also do readings, I'm a clairvoyant and I do numerology and graphology, and I've studied those subjects extensively, way back at the same time that I was doing hypnosis. So it's the combination of all of those skills that I'm bringing into a uh, hypnotic session as well. 
And sometimes you have to be able to tune into that person. Pretty, you have to do that very well because you haven't got time and they haven't got time to tell you every single subtle improvement they want or what's going on in their head. So I need to be able to tune into them. And uh, to do that quickly and easily, I'm, I'm using my psychic hunches, my psychic creativity. And that was part of what the, the knowledge was behind uh, Alpha Rhythm Training, teaching people to be psychic, to, teaching people to be clairvoyant, to know things that they shouldn't really know. And uh, so I incorporate that. You have this voice in your head. We have this internal dialogue. Everybody, if you tell them about it, they know about it. Sometimes people don't know about it unless you mention it. But you're walking down the street and you're saying, did I turn the iron off? Did I lock the door? Where's my car keys? Have I got my mobile phone with me? Is it on or is it off? Why did I say that to that person? You know, Why did she say that to me? Why did I say that to her? And we go over and over and over things. And that's that internal dialogue. But I've got a, a more interesting question about that. Yeah. Who is listening to it? Mm. Because thoughts can't listen to thoughts. So this brings up the question, who are you? What are you? Are you just a bunch of thoughts? And if you are, well, who's listening to the thoughts? Are you just a bunch of ideas and beliefs? If that's what you are, how come they keep changing all the time? Because what you are is, is unchanging. What you are, deep down, you feel the same now as you did when you were three. When you're 93, you'll feel exactly the same. You are the same. There's something about you that's constant, that's the same all the time. And yet, your ideas keep changing because at one time you believed in the tooth fairy and you believed in Santa Claus and now you don't. So your ideas and beliefs change all the way through your life. So you are not just your ideas and beliefs. You are not just your thoughts. You are not your body. So who are you? Now I give an analogy that you are the person with the body. You are the person with those thoughts. You are the person with those ideas. You have these ideas and emotions. You have these beliefs. You have this body. But you are not the same as your body. It's a bit like you're driving down the street in a car, but you never become the car. And you can get out of that car and get a new car. So you and the car are not the same. 